Welcome back, Lee Thurburn here again, and this is the fourth video in the sequence related to funding and financing. So we're going to talk about simplified registrations, basically private placements, and how to raise capital without doing an IPO. So because the Securities and Exchange Commission recognized that complying with Section A or Reg A of the Securities and Exchange Laws, the one that deals with going public, is very expensive and very onerous. They developed a set of uh, regulations that were designed specifically to simplify the process of raising money in certain situations. And the goal, of course, is to make it easy for small companies to get access to the capital that they need to grow. So there are a, there's quite a few different regulations, and we're actually not going to go through all of them. I have them listed here, but we're going to look in particular at Rules 504 and 506. Before we do, we need to uh, cover a concept which is a very important concept, and that is the concept of an accredited investor. Now, the definition of an accredited investor is actually written into the uh, Securities and Exchange Rules, and it is defined, a person who is an accredited investor is, as, is defined as an individual or a family who has uh, one million uh, in net worth, excluding their primary residence. An alternative test is if it's an individual, they have to have $200,000 in net income, taxable income, for two years in a row. Uh, if it's a married couple, they have to have $300,000 of taxable income for two years in a row. If you meet any or either of these tests, the net worth test or the income test, then you are, by definition, an accredited investor. Rule 504 allows you to raise up to $1 million a year. You are limited to only raising money from accredited investors. Uh, you, however, can talk to or approach or have an unlimited number of accredited investors. You do have to comply with state um, securities reg regulations, and the securities do not have to be restricted. So let's talk about each one of these. The rule related to up to $1 million per year, that's not a calendar year. So if you were to raise $1 million um, in January of, say, 2019, uh, you could raise another million in January, and depending on the exact date, either January or February of 2020. If you were to complete a raise on January 15th of 2019, you could start another raise on January 16th of 2020. So it's not a calendar year. Uh, it's a it's a year-to-year 365-day -year, uh, rule. The unlimited number of accredited investors means that you can have an unlimited number of accredited investors. So, uh, you know, you basically have no limit on how many people can invest in your deal. Now, that is not necessarily going to be the case in every state. So depending upon the state that you are in, you may have a limit on how many people can invest in your deal within a state. Now, states have their own securities registration requirements, and just because it's legal on the federal level does not necessarily mean that you will be in compliance um, at the state level. And by the way, let me just say this. I'm not an attorney, and so you should not rely on anything that I'm telling you. Uh, you should always seek the consultation and the advice of an attorney that is familiar with securities laws. Um, I have raised quite a bit of money in the past, and um, I do. I am very familiar with the laws, but I am by no means going to provide you with legal advice. Please be sure to get uh, the advice of an attorney. Now, the securities do not need to be restricted, and restriction basically deals with the ability of somebody to sell the security. Obviously, one of the attractions of having a corporation and being an investor in a corporation is that uh, you have readily transferable ownership documents, which are called stock certificates. So an investor investing in your deal will get a stock certificate evidencing the amount of stock that they purchased 
pursuant to the terms of your deal. They are not restricted in a, reg, in a Rule 504, Reg D, Rule 504 offering. So that's a good thing. Now, when you get to some of the others, you will have a restriction. And we're going to talk about that as we move along. The next rule that we're going to talk about is Reg D, Rule 505. And uh, in this type of offering, you can offer up to $5 million in any 12-month period, also to an unlimited number of accredited investors, and you can have up to 35 non-accredited investors. Now, the main difference in Rule 505 compared to Rule 504 is the requirement that you have certified financial statements. In other words, you're going to have to have an audit, and the securities need to be restricted. Let's talk about these things. First of all, $5 million is a pretty good chunk of money. This is a very popular offering uh, regulation under which offerings are made. The unlimited number of accredited investors is the same as the other. Now, you do have to be careful about how you solicit accredited investors. Um, there are rules that make it illegal to advertise, so you can't go out into the newspaper or the radio and uh, or onto a website and let people know that you're looking for money. You have to talk to them one-to-one. -one. You have to, um, you know, hand the document to them. You, um, you know, there's some restrictions on how, how you can approach the accredited investors. The up to 35 non-accredited investors, these are basically your friends and family. So one of the reasons this is a very popular regulation uh, to make an offering under is because it's so um, so common to get started with friends and family that are not accredited investors. And that kind of gets you some momentum going and uh, then you can go out and start getting accredited investors. The certified financial statements can be a bit of a problem. If your business has actually been up and running for any length of time, uh, getting an audit can be quite expensive. Because of the Sarbanes-Oxley um, Act, because of the failure of WorldCom and Enron, auditors have tremendous liability. And because they have tremendous liability, the days are long gone when a small CPA will do an audit. The liability is just too great, and so they simply don't do it. They have to charge too much, and there's too many liabilities that they have to be concerned with. The process has just become very cumbersome. So because of that, you're probably going to be looking at a fee on the minimum of around ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and getting into the twenty thousand dollar plus range is actually very easy to do. Now, there is a caveat to this, and that is if the business has not actually started yet, if you've got a brand new concept and a brand new business that has not started, then you don't need an audit, and so you can get around the audit requirement if the situation is such that you're literally starting the business from scratch at the point in time you're going out and raising the money. If you're going back out to get money and the business has already been running, then you are going to have to have an audit to be able to do a Rule 504 offering. And the securities are going to need to be restricted, which means that you're not going to be able to allow the, um, the stockholders to simply sell their securities to anybody they want to. You're going to have to have a shareholder agreement and a restrictions on the back of the stock certificate that are going to prohibit the ready transfer of the stock. Now, this is not typically a big problem because most of the investors that are going to be attracted to your offering are going to be familiar with this requirement, and they're going to have run across it many times. And so you're not going to get a, a real issue. Uh, that's not in and of itself going to be a real issue. Now let's talk about Rule 506B. Rule 506B is essentially the same as Rule 505, except that there's no limit on the amount of capital that you can raise. So if you need more than $5 million, you're not going to be able to use either a 504 or a 505. You're going to need to move into the 506. Other than that, it's pretty much the same. The next one is Rule 506C. And this is the crowdfunding rule that came out about, well, back in 2013, 2014, was implemented in two, 2015. Um, this is a rule 
that um, allows you to raise capital on the internet. And as a result, the crowdfunding websites uh, like EquityNet and Crowdfunder have come out. And now they are quite, um, quite active. There's no limit on the amount of capital raised, an unlimited number of accredited investors. Um, you cannot, however, have any non-accredited investors, so that's a little bit of a twist. You have to have an audit, and the, and the securities are restricted, but you also must verify the status of the accredited investor. On Rules 504, 505, and 506B, the responsibility to verify or validate that an accredit that one of your shareholders is actually an accredited investor is easy to get by because all you need is for them to make a statement to the effect that they are. They can simply sign a document saying that they uh, they understand what an accredited investor is and that they are one. And uh, that document is is an easy one for you to make up. You just list the requirements. They check off a box saying yes, I have a million dollars in net worth, or yes, I make more than 300000 a year for the last two years, and um, then they sign it, and they're good to go. But for Rule 506C, you have to validate or verify that they are, which means you're going to have to look at, they're going to have to provide you with some sort of documentation, either um, a statement from their financial advisor or an audit, um, you know, per, uh, basically a bank balance, a um, um, a net worth statement from their CPA. There's going to have to be some some documentation that's independent that you can look to and say with reasonableness that you uh, relied on it reasonably so to um, to know that they are in fact an accredited investor. And then you want to keep that documentation in your uh, or a copy of that documentation in your possession in case something comes up in the future. Now let's move on and talk about debt financing. I know that you've probably heard this said before, but the general rule of, do, of getting money from a lender, in particular banks, is that banks will never lend you money if you need it. They will only lend you money if you can absolutely prove that you do not need it. So the moral of the story is build a relationship with a bank and get your line of credit or your money set up so that you have a loan available to you before you actually need it. Now. Yeah, it may sound like I'm being facetious, but that's really exactly the case with banks. Banks want to remove as much uncertainty and risk as they possibly can. Now, the good news is that there's lots of debt available out there. There's lots of companies and banks, institutions that will lend you money. Um, our nation is largely built on uh, borrowed money, <laughs> and our government continues to prove that is the case. Um, we'll see how that turns out, but you know, you're not a government, you're going to have to pay it back. Debt is a popular tool. Um, and typically your debt's going to be tied to, um, some sort of a recognized interest rate, a prime rate. Uh, so you're going to, you're going to be able to borrow money without too much trouble, presuming that you meet the requirements that the lender has put forth. About half of all business loan applications are disapproved. They're not approved because for the following reasons. Weak credit scores uh, below 650. Management might be experienced. They need, you know, management typically needs to have some skin in the game. There's insufficient collateral to secure the fun, uh, the loans. Uh, the 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 venture, the enterprise has weak financial indicators. Basically, uh, the ratios that the bank is going to look at are not in line with what the bank would expect for your type of business. And as a result, the bank is going to turn you down. This happens quite often. Banks love collateral. Uh, banks like to remove as much of the probability that they'll be left hanging an empty, uh, holding an empty um, basket of assets. So they typically will only lend a percentage of the, uh, what they think the value of the asset might be when, when and if they have to go recover it. Accounts receivable are typically one of the most liquid things. They're usually going to be available to the bank to cover debts within 30 to 60 days. And as a result, accounts receivable are typically usually worth around 75% of their face value as far as borrowing money is concerned. In most cases, inventory will be worth about 50% of its uh, face value. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about your cost. They're not going to 
lend you 50% on the retail value of your inventory. They're going to lend you 50% on your cost. They'll lend about 75% on equipment and anywhere between 75 and 90% on real estate. Uh, those are average, typical numbers that you'll find as you talk to a variety of lenders. When it comes to getting debt financing, you're going to have to provide both personal and business information. Your personal information is going to be personal financial statements, um, and those will be required for each person that owns 19% or more of the business. So if there's three of you that own the business and you own it in relatively equal amounts, three, four, five, uh, pretty much all of y'all are going to have to provide personal financial statements. You'll probably all have to be guarantors, which means each of you will personally guarantee 100% of the debt that the business borrows. Um, each guarantor, each person is going to have to provide three years worth of personal tax returns and personal credit reports and resumes and all of that kind of stuff. So you're going you're gonna to have to provide a lot of personal information to the lending institution. You're going to have to provide similar information and a little more on the business. You'll need three years worth of financial statements and three years worth of tax returns. You'll need to provide current financial statements for the business that are in fact less than 60 days old. You'll also, if you have accounts receivable or accounts payable, you need to provide an aging of those. Um, if you have debt, you'll need to provide a schedule of the debt. Um, and a history of the business, along with copies of any property leases and uh, copies of your corp articles of incorporation, your bylaws and your your mini meeting uh, minutes, your, your board, board meeting minutes and your shareholder meeting minutes, probably for the last year or two. Um, they're going to ask you for all that, and you just need to know that you're going to need to be prepared to provide it if you want to get the financing. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment and think about from a little bit more global perspective um, where small businesses get their money. Well, about 49% of small businesses get their money from bank loans. About 43% basically provide themselves the money they need out of their cash flow, out of their retained earnings. An amazing 37% get the funding they need through credit cards, which is highly risky. Then, of course, you have vendor financing, private loans from family members, and uh, leasing, uh, taking on leased, uh, leased equipment, leased vehicles, that kind of stuff, and then a variety of additional things. Only 4% of small businesses get SBA loans, uh, and you can see the data here. So the general rule of thumb is that small businesses will get money from pretty much anywhere they can while they're in their earliest stages because they need to be able to get the capital that they need to grow. So what are the sources of debt capital? Well, your first and most important source is commercial banks. That's the really the reason that commercial banks exist. Now, they're, they're not in business to risk their money, and so commercial banks are kind of problematic for startup businesses. So if your business is in a startup mode, a commercial bank may not be a very good source of capital. But if you've been up and running for a while, and you have a, a cash flow stream, the first place you should go is to the commercial bank where you're currently banking because they have the history of your uh, deposits and withdrawals and they have the most confidence and the accurate, you know, kind of the, the, they have a relationship with you. So they are the first place that most small businesses go. The average loans about for a micro business is uh, $7,400 and for a small business about 181000 so commercial banks are a big-time player in the lending market. You, they also do a lot of short-term loans and um, intermediate and long-term loans. Uh, short-term loans will often be made by commercial banks on, on home equity loans, commercial uh, lines of credit, floor plans. Floor plans are typically for vehicles. If it has wheels or it floats or it flies, then you can get a floor plan on it. Um, and that would, of course, be for a dealer loan. So if you, have, if you have a vehicle lot that you're selling some sort of vehicle on, then, you know, you'd get a floor plan. Uh, lines of credit typically need to be, again, set up before you actually need them because if you wait till you need them, and this is true, again, with any bank financing, if you wait till you're desperate and absolutely positively have to have it before you go ask for it, you are probably in pretty big risk of not being able to get it. Um, installment loans and term loans are also sources of capital for you. 
If you go to your bank and they say something like our bank doesn't make small business loans, then you're banking with the wrong kind of bank. Um, if you go to your bank and they say, I don't know enough about your business, then you haven't shown them a good business plan because you should absolutely positively have a business plan that uh, supports the loan request that you're making. If your bank says you haven't told me why you need the money, then again, you don't have a good business plan and you probably don't know the banker. By the way, don't make the first time that you ever meet your banker the day that you go in asking for a $200,000 loan. You know, you should actually be prepared or be preparing the relationship over time. Wherever you're banking, whether it's personal banking or commercial banking, go ahead and start the process of getting to know your lender. Um, a great way to do that is to be active in things like local chambers of commerce, uh, be a volunteer in, on a variety of different local uh, nonprofits. Uh, bankers love to be on nonprofit boards and they're active in, in uh, chambers of commerce. And if it's you've been in a chamber of commerce or on a board with a banker for a couple of years, that person's going to feel like they know you. And they're going to be much more likely to be um, interested in lending you money than if they meet you the first time of the day you come in looking for a loan. If your numbers don't support your loan request, then, and this actually happens quite often, banks are going to run your loan request against industry loan, um, not loan, but industry uh, statistics, industry ratios to see whether or not uh, your business is um, performing in, in the bounds of what's con kind of considered reasonable normal boundaries in terms of things like cash flow and liquidity and debt ratios and stuff like that. So um, basically, if you get a response that you're not, um, your, your numbers don't support the loan, then you probably just simply need to go back and work on getting your ratios uh, in sequence with or in, in sync with what the industry averages are. If you're told you don't have enough collateral, then you're going to need to be prepared to get somebody to co-sign for you. Um, and you, the same thing if, it's, if you get the response that your business simply doesn't support the loan on its own. So these are common responses to a request for money, and you should be prepared to, um, to handle those uh, in advance. There are a number of specialized lenders out there, lenders that lend money on certain kinds of assets. There are a lot of lenders that will lend money on vehicles and on real estate and on inventory and on rolling assets. That's, uh, I guess, vehicles. I should have mentioned that. I was at one time working with a, a lender for a client that uh, the lender focused and in, in spe in specialized in tractor-trailer Tra uh, trailers. In other words, the long haul over the road, big boxes and flatbeds, and uh, they they dealt specifically with the box type uh, trailers, and they were experts in that market because they lent money on it. They knew what the resale value of trailers are. Uh, they understood that market, and that's all they did is they focused specifically on trailers for the long haul trucking industry. So my point is is that there's a lot of different specialized lenders out there that might very well be interested in lending to you. Now, the advance rate is the percentage of an asset's value that a lender will lend. And that kind of breaks us, brings us back to the same slide that we had before for banks. It typically boils down to 75% on the face value of your receivables, 50% on your cost of your inventory, 75% on your cost of your equipment, and 75 to 90% on the... Uh, price that you paid for the um, um, at the real estate that you're using in your business. Other sources of financing would include vendor financing where you get trade credit. Of course, equipment suppliers will typically often provide um, financing on their vehicles. Commercial finance companies, savings and loans. Uh, it might even be conceivable that you could get some money from stockbrokers um, that would be very specialized stockbrokers that would arrange that. That'd be a private lending situation. You can also go to credit unions. You can, of course, do private placements, which is what we talked about when we're talking about uh, Regulation D, 504, 505, and 506. You can go to small business investment companies and small business lending companies, and, of course, the ever-present Small Business Administration. 
In addition to the SBA, which is the last one listed here, you have a variety of additional uh, governmental sources, uh, Department of Housing, Economic Development Administrations, um, Agricultural Rural Business, the U.S. Department of Agricultural Rural Business Cooperative Service. There's, there's a lot of places that you can get loans if you're in the right sort of classification to, uh, to get those loans. The SBA is pretty active in lending. Uh, the SBA does not lend the money directly, but they guarantee loans for businesses. And really, right now, there has been a tremendous uptick in the amount of SBA loans that have been uh, made available because of the COVID that's hit the United States in the year 2020. Um, so it's actually pretty easy to get an SBA-insured loan and in some cases, you actually can get money directly from the U.S. government, depending upon what happens here in the late year 2020 post-election um, stimulus funding conversations that will be going on before or after the election is finalized. Uh, there may very well be a significant amount of additional money available to small businesses, relatively easy to get a hold of. The nice thing about SBA emergency loans, which is what the COVID is uh, uh, basically allowing uh, you to get if you're qualified is that you get a 30-year time frame to pay them back and it's a 1% interest rate. So it's an extremely attractive loan rate. Um, the SBA has been providing a lot of different loans. They're typically an SBA 7A guaranteed loan. This chart is a little hard to see, but it covers the years from uh, 2011 through 2020. 2019, uh, or actually 2018, and you can see that the number of loans on the top chart has stayed pretty steady, and the value, the dollar amount of the loans, has been gradually, uh, gradually increasing. There are other methods of financing. There are credit cards, which I, um, I will tell you that I know I have a good friend that financed the growth of his business on credit cards. Um, and his business is now doing over $4 million a year in revenues, and he did it entirely on credit cards to begin with. Most people that do that fail because they reach a point where they have a crunch and they're unable to pay their bill, and then suddenly the credit cards get cut off and the, the interest rates go through the roof, and uh, that's an incredibly risky thing to do. Uh, so before you engage in credit card-based financing of your business, make absolutely certain that you uh, can can pay them off every month on time. You can also factor accounts receivable and you can lease assets rather than buying them. Uh, so just know that if you're going to engage in uh, financing a business, you're often going to have a combination of grants, different grants from different sources. You're going to have loans, different loans from different uh, lenders, and you may have to go out and get capital more than one time. Um, and uh, different kind of capital raises. So uh, most small businesses have a mix of some sort of those uh, funding sources, and um, hopefully this kind of covered the, um, the, the general environment and gave you some cues, some, some tips on how to proceed. The next video will be on the difference between business plans, private placement memorandums, and prospectuses. Thank you for watching.